Hi, uh, my name is Nick Schweder. Um, welcome to a new episode of Meet the Gaffer, except this time you're talking to a Steadicam operator. So just to get a little bit of an idea about me, I was at San Francisco State for cinema. Um, when I graduated, I went freelance and worked my way through the camera department. Decided at some point that I needed to be less of an AC and more of an operator. So making the transition from a camera assistant to a Steadicam operator is quite a change. I think there's a lot of equipment to buy, it's a steep learning curve, but at some point you realize you've just got to take that leap and there are ways to transition that were a little easier if you get smaller rigs that can hold less weight, maybe a little less of the bells and whistles. I decided through my years of ACing um, to basically go all in with the savings that I had because I knew I wanted it so bad that I didn't want to have to buy a rig that would restrict me. And I had the means, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Typically, jobs will have a couple of standard things that are expected of a Steadicam operator. One is the typical walk and talk. Um, so a big skill to learn is just being able to walk and keep your subject in a certain part of the frame, um, not letting your horizons waver too much. Nobody likes a, to feel like they're on a boat. Um, whether that's walking forwards or walking in what's called the Don Juan, which is where you're walking forwards but the camera is turned backwards, which is a very, that's, that's a particular skill that takes a lot of practice. Um, a lot of people instead walk backwards and they will typically have a spotter, whether it's you know, the key grip or somebody on set to just make sure they're not walking backwards in anything and getting hurt. Um, so a walk and talk is really an important one to try to study right off the bat. And uh, another move that people typically like is the rounder around a subject, whether it's 180 degree to reveal maybe from behind them to in front of them, or um, sometimes a 360 degree shot just to get an idea of the space the subject is in. So uh, a big move is following a subject through a doorway. Um, it's a way to make a more dynamic shot moving into a scene from another space without having to worry about seeing track, without having to worry about maybe not fitting through the door. Um, it's another, that's, that's another great camera move to practice because in ways you have to find a way to skinny yourself up through a door without you know, a steady cam arm is gonna bump a doorway if you don't understand the space around you. So let's talk about the rig I have. Um, I have GPI Pro's CineLive package. Um, this comes with the CineLive sled and the Titan arm, which holds packages that range between 13 and 70 pounds, depending on how I swap out their spring canisters in each of these chambers. Um, and I have Pro's vest which um, definitely one of the favorites in the Steadicam community because it fits you snug, but it allows you to feel, it allows me to feel um, more control over how the whole system is you know, reacting and um, making sure I keep things stable and level. You can feel it a lot. And here, which is called the socket block, um, this is where the arm goes into and then where the arm links to the gimbal on the sled, and that's how the whole thing comes together. So, um, there are many different types of vests. Um, not any one is right for everyone. So it's really good to, you know, try, if, if there's anybody in the community that's letting you, that's willing to let you try a vest, maybe their vest, to see if it works good for you. And um, determine what essentially works best for your body type, for the way you like to operate. Um, all variables in the same way that finding the package that works for you. Um, it's really good, it's really important to find a vest that works for you because 
this is something, this is a very personal piece. Um, and it's very important to get a vest that you feel really comfortable with because once you get to places where the packages become heavier, you know, you don't want to be in a place where your work is hurting because um, of the discomfort from the vest. So, so I have my vest strapped in, mostly. So I have my vest strapped in. This is the arm in which goes into this socket block right here. It's important to have the socket block in an angle that allows your whole rig to fight you as little as possible. So this is uh, typically how you want to spend the time up until you're getting ready to shoot. You don't want to fight. Um, you don't want to be wearing the rig when you don't need to, whether it's um, blocking a scene or if you know actors are doing a, their own rehearsals. Um, it's important to wear it when you need to, but it's very important to dock your rig when you don't need it. Um, because even with lighter packages, this will wear on you. Uh, you know, 10, 12 hour day of hauling around a rig like this, it's only gonna make your work suffer if you're more exhausted than you need to be by, you know, halfway through the day or towards the end of the day. So the arm goes into here with this post, right into the gimbal handle. It's important to um, come into the rig without hurting your back. So there's a, there's a whole way in which to get into the rig correctly. There are people who specifically show correct ways to do that on, you know, YouTube if you look it up. Um, but now that I have the rig on, I'm going to dismount from the, from the bracket. And now I, here's the rig I have. I have the, the arm uh, the springs on the arm adjusted in a way that allows basically the camera to sit in this place without me working too hard. The idea of a rig is to basically move around in a normal way without having your camera basically bounce too much. So it's really good to also understand posture. Um, if you slump forward too much, your rig fights you too far forward. And if you lean back, it's coming too close to you. So being in a place where you stand up straight and your socket block is correctly aligned, you can kind of just stand there and let it sort of float. Um, and so with my, my camera package, much simpler camera package than, you know, your Alexa or red deal. Um, this is what I can practice with at home. Um, they, there are people online that make weight plates to make the packages more sort of in line with what you would be working with on set. Um, but this is really all you need, like uh, DSLR, and I, actually, I convert the HDMI to SDI, so I have a little like $15 converter and a little battery that goes, takes the signal through the post and out to the, this monitor. So. I can see what I'm doing. Um, it's really important to put yourself in a place where you can practice without having to be on set because the last thing you want to do is be unprepared for a certain job. Um, there are also basic things like having a drop time you like. Um, typically two, in between two and three seconds is what people um, favor. I, lean towards three seconds, one, one thousand, two, one thousand. It's a little, it's a little short for me. So I'm going to adjust this gimbal slightly so that when I let go, one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three. That has a drop time that I like better. Um, these are all really shorthand versions of things you're going to look for, but I recommend if you're really interested in specifics, getting um, Gary Hallway's Steadicam Operator's Handbook, which really goes into detail what it is you should be looking for in terms of balancing your rig, um, getting drop times right, uh, getting to a place where you can get better dynamic balance, which is allows you to pan, pan the rig 
without losing horizon, which I haven't done very well. It's not an easy thing to do, but um, that's a day-to-day -day battle for even seasoned Steadicam operators. Okay, now I have the rig on. Let me show you those three moves I was talking about earlier. So the first is a walk and talk. So Luke's gonna follow me to the back of my door. And the idea is keep him in a similar spot in the frame. Don't lose headroom. Understand your surroundings a little bit, like the fact that the door is right behind me. Usually you'll wanna do that, like you'll wanna walk through it once or twice before you actually put the rig on so you get an idea of it, especially if you don't have a spotter. Um, now we're gonna go forward. Keeping him in the same spot. And that doesn't have to be the case, it's just me trying to show you sort of what people typically ask for. Uh, now I'm gonna try a rounder. And I'm just gonna go around my docking bracket just so you get an idea of what I'm trying to say. So, there's my docking bracket. And I'm just gonna walk backwards around it. Keep it in the center of the frame. Um, as you can see, I'm doing my best to not let it slump in frame too often, but it still does occasionally, which is why practice is important. I'm also gonna go forward. Understanding proper ways to step so that you're not getting any extra bounce in your, your shot. And um, now let me try going through a door. So let's open this guy up real quick. Now the idea is, door's a pretty narrow space for the build I have on. So you just wanna be able to practice and know how big you are in relation to the door and knowing when to tuck in a little bit without messing up your shot. So, camera set and camera moves. And I'm just making sure I tuck in my arm so that I don't hit my door. And coming through the same way, not letting the barrier of the door ruin my shot. Coming up on Luke and ending. And uh, after a couple of those, it's always good to understand when you need to dock in between takes so you don't kill yourself and ruin your shots later in the day. And those are a couple of little things. Obviously there's so many more things to practice and I'm just barely reaching the surface of what all goes on with this. But thanks for watching and uh, we'll see you next time. I compare steady camming to learning an instrument. It's a steep learning curve at first. It really, it just takes practice. Practice, practice, practice. Um, it's great to be able to pick the brain of somebody who has been an operator for a while. I was very fortunate in that I had local colleagues who were very willing to give me advice. Um, I did take the Steadicam certification workshop in which I learned so much in such a short amount of time from operators who had been doing it not only for decades, but were people that had originally built these systems like Garrett Brown. So learning from people like that, it's amazing what you can learn from a few days with another person rather than just figuring it out all on your own. There's a lot to be learned just being on set that you couldn't learn otherwise. So being able to say yes to work that other operators have decided is not worth their time is, is huge. It's really, it's important to show a little bit of humility going into it because it's not an easy craft to learn. People that have been doing it 
for you know, 25, 30 years, still learn something new every day. So it's important not to undercut you know, the, your community's typical rates and rental rates, but um, it is very worthwhile to you know, get onto a production where a steady cam wasn't necessarily a possibility budget-wise, and it becomes a mutual, like, you get experience and they, they get higher production value out of their projects. So it's, that's very much how I got my ball rolling in terms of working my way from really like low budge music videos and low budge narratives to starting to work on things with a much more substantial commercial rate or um, what's considered scale rates. Because Steadicam operating is a very specialized form of operating, um, sometimes clients or DPs that hadn't worked with Steadicam too often in the past, um, they like the ideas but they don't necessarily have a great grasp of how to use it. And so a big thing I enjoy is showing them options of ways that they can make a shot more interesting, more dynamic. So I, that's something I really enjoy about being a Steadicam operator.